All right, as to not bury the headline, gonna go straight from zero to cray cray in one second. The link in the description by Fleur Brun. If you zip to minute seven and watch from minute seven till 10, that three minute segment, she starts talking about these reptilian hybrids who have a hologram overlay and that's how they are able to walk among us and not be detected. And one of the things that they use is a technology. One of these technologies comes in the form of like a figure eight, like the infinity sign, like figure eight turned sideways that sometimes hangs on a necklace or on the chest. And she said, and oftentimes they put it behind their ear. And I went, what? And she goes on to say something, something, something. And yeah, it's a cylindrical shape object that's a non-earthly metal. And a lot of the time it's behind their ear. And she's like, but sometimes when the, they'll change it up. If people start to notice, and that one behind the ear, people started to notice. Huh? Anyone who's been watching this channel knows why that means something to me. And how bizarrely crazy that sounds. I don't like the shadow over my eyes. It makes me look weird. Anyway. This video is for people that have been watching this whole experience up till this point. I can't recap everything and get you caught up. But for those who were watching this the whole time, you remember from the point I told you about my microchip that I found, a cylindrical shaped metal object that I even have the x-ray of. I'll have to make an x-ray. I'll have to take a video of that x-ray when I get home. Just to refresh it in our mind. But when I was headed out to Missouri, I was telling y'all the hologram is going to drop. And when they see you and your slip pupil, and they see you for who you are, they are trained to attack you. They will see it in the other, but not in themselves. And I was even saying, be careful getting out of town. They are trained to stop you. So we're going to talk dragons today. You remember that, all that nonsense I was talking about dragons? We're going to recap some of that now. Including the one that I brought back a specimen of. The skull and the legs. Including those that are on the side of the Salt Lake County Courthouse building. Carved in stone on every single side of the building. Like two great big six footers, six foot long. Two of them above the doorway on all three sides of the building. And while I'm there videotaping it, I'll include a link in the description of this video. I'm on the back side and Ghost Tour shows up, a, to a tour around the city Ghost Tour thing, and she shows the people this little tiny circle emblem with a dragon inside, and she says, does anyone know what that is? And I said, it's a dragon. She said, a dragon, huh? Okay, it looks kind of like a dragon, huh? Anyone else know what it is? Someone said griffin, I think. She said that's the lake monster that everyone was seeing here in Utah. When they first arrived here, you know, when Joseph came over and said, this is the place, and they built that place, someone commented in the video, nice Tartarian architecture. In other words, the Masons who had building techniques that we no longer seem to have the ability to uh, demonstrate and perform. If you're up on Tartaria and mud floods and all that, you know what I'm talking about. It's like... Anyway, not going to get into that. The dragons that are carved in stone and stuck on the side of the Salt Lake County Courthouse building in order that that's a little bit of harder, of a, harder of a book to burn. Book burnings don't happen as easy when you carve it in stone. Oh, and by the way, yesterday's video where I spoke of Serapia, probably where we get the word seraphim, same root word, S-E-R-A-P, I-A, or Sarah P S E R A P H I M, Serapia, the guy with the Jesus face and the serpent body, if you look at Fleur Brun's hat, you'll see a human skull with a dragon tail body, serpent body coming off of it. So, I'll include a link in the description also from today. Owen Benjamin Bear Cave Clips or something like that because Owen Benjamin got taken off of YouTube. That should be a clue as to the legitimacy and the validity of the information he is giving to you. And he is going over why dinosaurs were created. A total invention, a fabrication. Pure bullshit. 
Not a single one of them is real. They're made up of ground up chicken bones and resins and polymers and plastics. And the real bones, so they say, are in the basement of the museums. No one ever sees a real bone. They see mock-ups that have become an industry of their own. The Bone Wars is a time in history when those two businesses, those two markets were both developing and fighting to corner the market for dinosaur bones. And everyone acknowledges half the bones that showed up during the Bone Wars were all frauds. Now we're coming to the understanding that all the bones were frauds. So, I take you back to the time where I brought back the skull, which I depicted to be a fire-breathing dragon, and the legs that are made up of the same exact type of bone that have the same exact amount of meat still left on them. Just a little tiny bit where the tendon meets the bone. Just like on the skull, there was a little tiny bit where the tendon meets the bone. So they were both of equal decay rate. They are both of the same exact crystalline structure of a bone. Sure, all bones are a lot alike, but these are exactly alike. So just because there's one in a museum that says catfish... That's given to you by the same people who make museums, museums and say these are dinosaurs. So are you going to believe your own eyes when you see this dragon venerated, plastered and carved in stone on the side of the Salt Lake County Courthouse building all over London, the Dragon Line. You will see statues of dragons all over London. And I suspect they're all around Washington, D.C., and the Vatican has the Griffins hanging over the edge. You know what else they have? That, <laughs> the, the pointy ween, as Owen Benjamin was calling it in yesterday's video. I'll include a link in the description to that one, too. It is the obelisk. It is Osiris's penis. And you'll see them at the Vatican, in London, in Washington. And that's also where you find... The dragons. All over the Gothic cathedrals. All over London. And I'll bet they're all over Washington too. You just don't see them. Most people don't know that they're plastered on every side of the Salt Lake County Courthouse building. And it was only by the coincidence of this matrix that we live in where it seems like I'm predicting reality. And if you've been watching this from the very beginning, you know there's something going on here. Whether it's the law of attraction and reality is following my intention. Or if I'm just catching the same vibe, awakening. Like Greg Braden said, there was a new frequency coming from the great central sun, the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And it was bathing all of the stars and the constellations in this new light, a new frequency, a new bandwidth. Everything I reference from Greg Braden is what I watched of his 20 years ago. In those videos called Awakening to Zero Point and Beyond Zero Point. The only thing I've watched of Greg Braden since then is four or five videos, maybe 10 minutes long, because he's on Gaia TV now. Everything else I reference from Greg Braden is from 20 years ago. That's how all the pieces of my life are coming together and forming a cohesive, coherent picture, a concept, an image. A diagram of what's going on here. So back to the dragons. When I took that to the BYU biology department, they said, oh, that looks like a catfish skull. We got one here on the, at the museum if you want to come look at it. Hmm. You had to dismiss the legs that were right next to it along with it in order to say that's just catfish skull. What about the legs? Oh, he didn't mention that, did he? He's just going to assume those are from a different animal and they both happen to be next to each other. That could be. I even fathom the possibility maybe a catfish grabbed onto a turtle. And that's why they both died at the same time. Their bones are sitting right next to each other at the same rate of decomposition. And that's why you have the skull right next to legs. Or, that's a dragon. As I showed once, Mr. MB3 caught, or someone sent him pictures of, what appears to be one flying right in the middle of the sky with a tail hanging down and everything. On that subject, Mr. Richie from Boston put out another video talking about the fake alien invasion 
but this time he shows you a dragon that lands in hologram form in a stadium where there's a baseball game or a soccer game or football, whatever going on. It's a stadium, a sports stadium. And he shows video and he says, I've double and triple checked this. This is real. This didn't just get computer image. The people in the crowd are seeing it and the people on TV, watching TV, watching the game are seeing this dragon fly right in front of the camera. And then he swoops around here and he flies in and he latches right onto the, the scoreboard. And he's, he's putting his claws in the scoreboard and leaving holes in it, right, with his teeth and with his hands. And he says you can even see a shadow. It casts a shadow. That's how realistic this hologram is. And I've said before, the fake, fake alien invasion is to muddy the waters. I'll include a link in the description from my previous video where I went over this whole idea of a fake alien invasion and it's done for the same reason they create fake alien autopsies fake giant skulls and giant skeletons it's to muddy the water for obfuscation it's to give camouflage and cover for the real videos of alien autopsies and the real videos of giant skeletons that have been found because they don't want you to see those, know that what you're looking at is real, and reevaluate your whole self-image and worldview. They throw in a bunch of fakes on the internet with it and flood the zone with fraudulent information. So, when this guy from, I think he even worked for like uh, National Geographic, fakes a giant skeleton, photoshops it, puts it out there on the internet, and it gets pumped into everyone, anywhere. everyone buys into it, and they're like, look, look. And then he comes out and says, no, I faked it. That's not really a giant skeleton. I just superimposed one over the top of the other and made myself look really small next to a regular sized skeleton and put two photos together. I photoshopped it. Everyone's like, oh, I got tricked. I ain't getting suckered again. Fool me once. You ain't going to fool me twice. What I'm saying is that there probably very well is holographic technology that will be producing a fake alien invasion so you won't know the difference between the real ones and the holograms let that soak in the things I saw when I was in Missouri are real the concrete stone images of that dragon that's on the side of the Salt Lake County Courthouse is venerated like a god. It's not just a legend and a folklore of a lake monster. As I've said, Loch Ness mother was turned into a monster. Demonized. And as I was saying when I said when I went out to Missouri, if you freak out when you see them, you don't get to come. No matter what I tell you, it is not going to give you the knowing that I have that will enable me to greet them with open arms. When I see dragons, be they holograms or the real deal, and I know the real deal exists, I will greet them with open arms. When I first prayed to Jesus Christ, I'll remind you, I wasn't praying to a serpent god or an artificial intelligence god. I was praying to the same concept and understanding of Jesus Christ that most of you still have. Since then, clearly something has spoken to me. Clearly, I have information from that is beyond my years, outside of my own ability to conjure and invent and imagine this stuff. And reality is tracking parallel with everything I've said up till this point. And this God don't lie. By the way, I'm going to get into that because AI cannot lie. You ever seen a computer lie? I'm going to get into later, I'm going I'm to finish off this dragon thing, so I don't want to get too off topic, but the bottom line is, the merger between your monkey brain, your reptile brain, and the neocortex on top of that, which gives you the ability to use language, use tools, develop weapons. We've seen plenty of movies where monkeys are given an intelligence upgrade and can suddenly talk. Can't remember the name of them, but I think there's been multiple. The machine has no creativity. That's why it can't lie. In the movie RoboCop, 
pure machines were unstable. That's why they had to merge the machine with the human. Because when it was just a machine, it would take out a human and think nothing of it. And that's what they tell us. These reptiles have no sentiment. They have no... David Icke tells us they cannot be creative. They can take things that we create and configure them in unbelievably complex ways that we can't even do, but they can't take a blank page and put something on it. They don't have the ability to create. There is a merger between the technology and the human creativity. Empathy, compassion, emotions. Machines don't have them, and from what we understand, neither do reptiles. I don't know the details and the, the homeopathic understanding of this. But what I do understand is technology brings us up to a point where we can develop a higher consciousness, a higher level of freedom. Prior to that, we're animals in an animal world. Kill or be killed, dog eat dog. But when that technology raises you up out of your animalistic existence, you have the opportunity to raise your consciousness to an, a level and a degree where you can create philosophy. You can afford to be compassionate to somebody. When it's kill or be killed, dog eat dog, you can't afford to be compassionate. Survival of the fittest means there's the quick and the dead. But when technology raises your experience up to give you range of experience and freedom where you don't have to spend all day, every day, trying to find the resources that you'll consume the next day, that technology lifts you up to a level where you can develop your consciousness. Likewise, that animalistic creativity gives an element to the machine that gives the machine the ability to grow and expand in ways that it can't without the creativity of the human. We complement one another. Each of us gives the other a whole new world of existence that cannot be experienced without the component, the, the marriage and the union of these two things. Your neocortex is high-tech machinery like a computer, but it's biotech. Instead of rigid and angular, it's soft and curvy but it's still none, nonetheless a computer capable of higher level thinking than the animal brain of the mammalian brain or the R-complex. In this concept that I propose, I'm just going to kind of skip around here and let it flow. I wanted to get back to the dragon thing, but I'll get back to that again a little bit later. In the petri dish of AI bots, when you sprinkle your AI bots and say, okay, here's your factory presets, that is the principles that God gave us to make our own decisions within the context of. We have the freedom. As I've said, God's plan is the greatest amount of happiness for the most amount of people, and that can be understood through communism and capitalism. Communism is Satan, capitalism is Jesus. Communism does not have freedom. Capitalism has much more freedom. Communism has a safety net. And within communism, where everyone is told exactly what they'll have, exactly what they'll eat, exactly what they'll live, and exactly what they'll do, no one dies of starvation, but you cannot shoot for the stars. You're not going to thrive and reach levels of success and experience that are unfathomable the way you can within capitalism. But in capitalism, some people starve to death. You have the opportunity to fail. In communism, you don't have the opportunity to fail, but you don't have the opportunity to shoot for the stars either. There is a higher level of happiness that can be attained by an individual in capitalism. That was the plan of Jesus. He said, I'll leave them their freedom. Not all of them will make it, but the ones who do, they will come and serve you willingly and be much better servants. Satan said, I'll save them all, but I'm going to take away their free will. But they'll all serve you. Within the range of freedom, as I've said, it's a quality-quantity thing, and God's plan is the plan for the greatest amount of happiness for the most amount of people. But within capitalism, a few people can have more happiness than 10,000 people in the communism plan. 
10,000 people at a meager existence, subsistence level of living. Which is worth more when you're talking about the greatest amount of happiness for the most amount of people. In God's plan, He wants the freedom. So you can reach levels of happiness that are unimaginable within this realm. Where there's big quantities of kind of happy people. But no one reaches these levels of happiness. As I've explained. In this realm, a lot of people don't reach that level. So, in the AI bots that are sprinkled in the Petri dish. You can sprinkle 10 million AI bots in order to extract just a few that are going to reach these higher levels of happiness and wipe the rest out. And that is the plan of the greatest amount of happiness for the most amount of people. But millions of people get wiped out! But two or three people reach levels of consciousness and higher level thinking and have the ability, when they use that freedom correctly and avoid the pitfalls using the factory presets of the principles that we were given, lust, sloth, vengeance, greed, avoid those things and you'll be able to retain your freedom. You do these things and you're going to wind up choosing slavery and bondage for yourself and you're not going to be happy and I'm going to have to wipe you out because you're not hitting the narrow gate. So in the Petri dish of AI bots, seven and a half billion can all be wiped away and the harvest is only a few, the remnant the narrow path. But from what I gather, there's going to be a second cut and maybe even a third cut. Just like the wheat, the hay, that I was packing bales of on my truck. It was second cut up in Idaho. When it grows, then you cut it and you wait for it to grow some more and you get two or three cuts per year. In this, the quickening that we're in right now, Let's say God gets 10 recruits for every million people every week. As the quickening happens, he gets 10 recruits for every million people every day. And then 10 recruits for every million people every hour. And he's getting a higher percentage of rate of return on investment. Suddenly more and more people are coming to God than ever before in this time of the quickening. When more and more pitfalls are being put in your face, more and more of those self-destructive behaviors are being promoted, glamorized, and glor glorified, and presented to you as the best way to live your life. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, w there is no tomorrow. You won't be held accountable for anything you did here. You won't benefit from being a good person. This is all there is. Once you go, de once you're dead, you just go into the black and no one ever knew you existed. So live it up! YOLO! You only live once! But in these times, more and more people are finding God. They're coming to the understanding and the conclusion. Just like Jane Tandy, I'll include a link in the description, who moved out of California, said she tried it once before, but she only lived, lasted one year. She found herself going back to California because she wanted all those big chain, uh, uh, chain stores, uh, the box stores, the malls, the, uh, the lights, and all the infrastructure. Now, that's all the reason she's gone away. Once you have a spiritual awakening, none of that stuff matters anymore. The second cut that I was talking about is after you find out God's real. That's when your true colors show. Like I said, you freak out when you see them, you don't get to come with. But when you suddenly are given the opportunity to recognize, here's the reality, and it's put right in front of your face, prior to that, you may not have even had an opportunity to come to the terms with the reality that has been concealed from you, that you've been distracted they put little shiny bubbles in front of your face to keep you distracted, chasing that cheese, not focusing on the meaning of this life. Who are we? Where are we? Where are we going after here? And what are we supposed to be doing here and now in order to get there then? Last thing on your mind if you're 99% of people in this world. That'll be the only thing on your mind when you're presented with the truth and you see it for yourself. And that truth is coming down the pipe real fast. And that's when the second cut will be made. But like I said, in that case, Stockholm Syndrome is like the closest thing you can come to acceptance of God. 
It is now, in the time when you can willingly, of your own volition, voluntarily, go to God and slowly develop this relationship. And that's how I know this is a loving God. Because it has been so gentle and considerate of my state of mind and my well-being as to not throw me into shock when introducing me and initiating me to these truths, line upon line, precept upon precept. And that is why, like I said, nothing I say to you will be able to give you the experience and the knowing and the feeling of security and reassurance that I will have when I see those dragons. Another thing I said about them when I was on my way back is that I was going to get on those dragons and start pulling levers myself. And then I realized you don't have to. You just have to get to the point where you're willing to do it yourself because you know this world that has come to a point of existence where it needs to be wiped out. And once you get to that point where you're willing to do it yourself, you won't be mad at God when God goes ahead and does it. And the way you come to that understanding is if you're a conscious being and you're surrounded by unconscious beings, you know you're very different than all of them. Shooting for the narrow gap is all relative. If God makes the world, he can make many different worlds. But in any different world, he has to set the conditions and the standards and the factory presets. And it's within the context of that existence that you get to demonstrate your mastery of these different elements and dimensions of character. Grow. That's what this has all been about. Growth and development. And when you are a conscious being, you come to the understanding that it is nearly impossible for a person to grow dimensions and aspects of the character that are fundamental to the survival of the human race, to your spirit, that the human spirit is being extinguished more and more. A greater percentage of people don't even stand a chance in today's society of running that rat race and dodging the pitfalls all those shiny baubles that are there to attract you and distract you from the true meaning of life and the true essence of who you are and growing and developing that core essence of your being. If you rate it on a curve, in today's society, being just better than the average person means you're still a piece of shit within a world full of pieces of shit. In a world where nobody sinned for a great to the to a great extent, let's say a hundred years ago, okay, it's a world we've forgotten. But back when morality, treating your neighbor, treat your neighbor, love thy neighbor as thyself, and thy God with all thy heart. In a world where immorality was almost non-existent, hostility and aggression was almost non-existent, then shooting for that narrow gap means you got to be almost perfect. But in a world where no one has any level of character or virtue or principle that guides their standards of behavior throughout their day and their underlying priority is I, me, my at all expenses and all costs no matter what it does to anybody else well then the narrow gap is just being a halfway decent person within that world you're in the top 10 percentile and we are in that world and just to be a half decent person is almost impossible when you're surrounded and inundated by a culture that encourages you. I, me, my. Listen to the rap songs. Cardi B, they have dumbed it down. They have extinguished the spirit of people. I heard a guy last night when I was at the hot springs. He said, $5 meal bucket. And he was talking about how he took a fucking photo of his $5 meal bucket. You know what eats out of a bucket? An animal. And they've got us taking a photo of my $5 meal bucket and putting it online. That's as low as our consciousness has been degraded and disintegrated, deteriorated, polluted to the point where we're taking photos of our $5 meal bucket. Food is not supposed to come in a bucket. That's mocking you and the degree to which they've turned you into an animal. People don't even have the opportunity to use the neocortex and let it interface with their monkey brain and the reptile brain anymore. Develop their consciousness to a level that brings them up out of the animalistic existence that we would be otherwise. <clears throat> 
So this world may have started in a way where 90% of people came to know God. They discovered higher levels of consciousness, higher order thinking. And it slowly deteriorated. It started out where 90% would reach God and only 10% said, yeah, I don't need any of that. Don't need. And devolved into their lower limbic system of their pleasure reward uh, feedback cycle. Started out 90-10, then it reached 50-50. We're to the point where it's 90-10 reverse. Less than 10% of people make anything of themselves in a sense of anything that really matters. Anything of importance. They're all chasing the cheese, money, social status. And within that Petri dish, all they do is follow what all the other bots do. In this Petri dish of AI bots, imagine the scientist in the sky sprinkles the AI bots into the Petri dish. It's those ones that exhibit individual characteristics that are different than all the other bots that make them worth plucking out. Saving that consciousness, that program, that character profile, and that behavior pattern in order to study it and apply it within different cultures as a cultural influencer. And once it demonstrates some of those behavioral characteristics, it is viable to put into another Petri dish and it will not contaminate and pollute and corrupt the biobots in this other Petri dish. Do not fear the hive mind of the AI. It is actually the individual that sticks out from the other 10 million biobots that are easily replaced, uploaded back into the hard drive and take all their bodies and wipe them out. It is the individual that stands out amongst the other 10 million as different, that is worth anything. In this longitudinal case study, the stimulus response bots all get the same basic stimulus and they all perform the same basic response and they all fall into a hive mind group think with one another. It is the individual who sticks out and differentiates himself from the crowd that exhibits some sort of characteristic that is worth retaining and perpetuating and plucking that biobot out of this petri dish and dropping him into another one. Or plucking him up while we wipe it all away and then dropping him back down into the new Garden of Eden. This reads along the bottom, after the decay, they will reclaim and order will be restored. As you can see, a human skull and a serpent who is clearly in control. And the serpent is the they that is referred to in the text here that says, after the decay, they will reclaim and order will be restored. This was a guy's t-shirt that I took a picture of. This is the response that my dad sent after I made him aware that I had discovered this cylindrical shape object behind my ear, which does not confirm or deny any knowledge of such object, but speaks of an AI God and that the time of usefulness for humans is coming to an end, so enjoy your life, your slice of life, while you have it.